here live on Sunday mornings from 9 to 9.30 to help you with your Garden of Eden, turning it into the Garden of Eating. Uh, the Garden of Eden or Eating, if, if you're growing a vegetable garden. My name is Frank Fergini, a.k.a. Frankie Flowers of City TV's Breakfast Television and City Line, where you can see me Monday through Fridays, giving you the weather as well as giving you some garden advice right on City TV. We go nationally as well. If you wonder a little bit about me, I'm a four-time best-selling garden author. That's just one of my books, Power Plants. Uh, I'm always here just to try to motivate you to garden, to teach you a little bit more, to kind of guide you through. Plus, there's a wonderful community on here. So when you ask some of those questions, if I don't get to answer them, what you're going to see is people on the chat actually will hop on and start to answer the questions for you. So be if you have a question, ask a question. You can always uh, join me too on frankieflowers.com, which is my website. Uh, Carol, good morning from you to from Ajax this morning on the sunny morning here in the month of July. We're in July already. Pietro, good morning to you as well. There's a good morning from Pietro. There you go as well. Um, so yeah, uh, it is July and July is a month in the garden where we go through periods of extreme warmth, hot temperatures. We actually go through some periods of drought often. And as well, uh, our plants are really growing. We're harvesting now. I've already harvested cherry tomatoes, cucumbers, lettuce. Some of my lettuce have bolted, which means that they spread it up the top. <clears throat> I'm just gonna get a little drink of coffee here as well. Um, I have loads of kale available in my garden right now, loads of herbs. It's a fun time, but we gotta be on the lookout for bugs and slugs, disease as well. Uh, good morning as well. We got another shout out here this morning from Brantford. That's from Connie this morning. Marlene is saying good morning as well. Uh, also, we have Cheryl saying good morning this morning. Uh, okay, so a couple things. Just a few days ago, actually just yesterday morning, I woke up on the Atlantic Ocean on the Disney Wish Cruise. I'm just going to show you guys and share with you some of the pictures. Uh, that's the cool thing about my job. My job with breakfast television, you never know where they're going to send you. And so this week, they sent me on a cruise, on a Disney cruise. So this is my Instagram page. If you ever want to follow me on Instagram, you go to Frank Ferragini, or you can just type in Frankie Flowers. You'll see me there. That's the picture you're going to see. As we scroll down, here's a little look at the cruise itself. Uh, this was the first time that the Disney Wish had gone out. It was an absolutely amazing time. I got to be there with my two boys, Gavin and Matheson. And behind that taller guy there is Colton. Colton is uh, a family. Colton calls me Uncle Frank. He's 18, so he actually was just hanging out with the boys on the trip. That's a look at Castaway Key, which is in the Barbados. Always oh, wonderful tropical plants out there. Hibiscus, of course. Oleander, Bougainvillea. When you think of the tropics, what plants do you think? Hey, there's Chewbacca. Uh, yeah, there's Devo Brown as well, which is our entertainment host on breakfast television. Uh, this is one of the kids' areas, which is pretty cool as well. Look at this coffee. This is a coffee that they made for us. And on the top, they have any cricket. Look at that. That's a fancy foo-foo coffee. Uh, this is a look at the uh, fireworks display that they have on the side of the ship when you do the cruise as well. This is a part of the Pirates Party. Good times, guys. Good times. Uh, you know what? I didn't get any motion sickness whatsoever. This is my first cruise in my life on the boat itself. And probably the highlight of my boys' trip, if you're wondering who the heck that is, that's Uncle Jesse from Full House. John Stamos. Yeah, John Stamos was on the boat as well. Uh, nice guy. I got to uh, spend some time just talking to him, hanging out as well. Uh, the boys themselves uh, had a wonderful time, and they were really super stoked about John Stamos. So the reason why I show you my trip, and you're probably like, well, why the heck are you showing my trip? What does this have to do with the world of gardening? So I left on Tuesday. I returned on Saturday. And uh, I be on Monday night, man, did I ever water my plants. I soaked all my containers like really soaked them well, watered my lawn, watered my garden super well. And of course we did have a little bit of rain throughout the week. I came back and I would say, um, you know, nobody came to water my gardens. Uh, that was my mistake. I should have organized that, but I didn't. I was really kind of busy and I didn't lose any plants at all, but I will say that, you know, my eggplant, actually one of them kind of struggled a bit um, after watering bounced right back. But the key is, is I know that many of you are going on trips this summer because uh, things are getting a little bit better and maybe going away. So the first thing is, is when you're going away, you would need to develop a strategy for your plants, both indoors and out. 
if you're going away for an extended period of time, you will need somebody to come in and water. We have longer daylight hours, especially outdoors, as I was mentioning. We have longer periods where we don't have any rainfall that's out there. And because we have longer daylight hours and a little bit of a breeze, things dry out quickly. That's why I always say, if you look at my garden and I post some pictures, you'll see that I have a lot of big pots, big pots. And the reason why is that when I soak them on a Monday, they usually have enough moisture there to help them through all the way through, if they're established, all the way through to that Saturday morning that I returned. Well, actually it was Saturday evening. Um, and if I would have left them for another day, I would have lost some plants as well. So the other thing that we can do is if we're going to be away, not only do we water them is actually by grouping them together, by actually putting them all together and maybe even pushing them into part sun, they'll last a little longer. They won't uh, dry out as fast if they're in groupings because they won't evaporate as fast. Um, you know, there are the watering things that you can put in that you can actually put the self waters where you put in. And then of course you fill them up with water and they gradually release. If you're long away for a long period of time, the only other solution for that is to put a watering system in is put them all on drips and then put that on a timer and then that will water away. But water, water, water in the summer is your key to success. Too much or too little will cause failure. Proper watering, if you can water in the morning, keeping the water off the foliage is really key. And a reminder, your water of your lawn needs about an inch per week. Raise those more blades up there too as well. The lawnmower blades, make them a little taller. Uh, Carolyn, uh, good morning, Frankie. When my un endless summer hydrangea blooms are spent, can I cut them off? Yes, indeed. So you're just going to go to the bottom of that stem where the flowers are off <clears throat> and you're going to remove them. That puts more energy back into the plant. And that will make the plant focus on its foliage and on its leaves. Ooh. That's super key <clears throat> because it's going to be able to make it a healthier plant overall. And that's the rule of thumb with anything that has a spent flower on it. A spent flower means that it's a dead flower. If you're new to garden talk, spent is just another, like I'm spent. I've had it. I don't have any more. That's a spent flower. So by removing a spent flower, we actually put more energy back to the flower at the plant. And even with like delphiniums after they bloom, if we cut them to the ground, sometimes we get a second bloom with annuals, removing the spent flowers off of geraniums, We'll actually put more geraniums on that plant. So deadheading and the removal of spent and or dead flowers is a must during this, uh, the summer month. Hey, this is it. Let's see what this one, Deborah Boozy. I don't know how to send digital stars. If I didn't get, a, if you didn't get a million, thanks for sharing with us. Have an awesome day. The digital stars, I'm just learning about it as well. It's a way for people like myself and content creators that can create a little bit of uh, money by doing this. I do this, uh, I'm not sponsored, but I do work for Scott's Miracle Grow. So they're a part of the ones that actually help me with my ability to create content and put it out there and support because Scott's goal as well is for you to have great gardens and they have, they really do. They have great garden products. If they weren't great, I wouldn't speak about them. Um, but uh, I love it. Uh, Tanya says, good morning, Tanya. We're just a few weeks away where we're going to be going on that river cruise. That river cruise, so I, I, it's so ironic. I've never been on a cruise in my life, and now I'm going on two in one month. Um, that river cruise, it's going to be in Basel, Switzerland, going up the Rhine. Going to be able to show you a lot more flowers on that trip. This trip here was all about Disney, Disney characters, and having some fun with my friends. Um, uh, there we go. I'm just going to pop back over there. I just got kicked out of there for a second. Uh, here's another question. Lori, Kitty, I planted corn. Should I be worried about caterpillars? about that caterpillar that's affecting corn. Um, you should be worried about anything if you planted corn. You should be taking the time to uh, go out there and inspect the garden, your vegetable garden. So what you can do is an insecticidal soap, but with a caterpillar, you can actually apply what's called BTK. BTK is Bacillus, Bacillus thuringiensis, And that there, if you see the caterpillars, will take care of caterpillars overall. Uh, caterpillars, of course, you know, with corn, corn is fairly resilient overall, but just going out checking if you don't see any damage at this current time just an application of an insecticidal soap is completely fine something like bug be gone can be used on edibles no problem and then just all they need to do, be done is washed off thereafter once again it's health canada approved uh why are there here's another question that we have from tj uh teresa why are some maple leaves turning so soon so if a maple leaf is turning at this moment so if we're seeing uh, some colorization well, it's losing chlorophyll. So if it's losing the green in the leaf, that's what fall colors when we see them. It means that that maple tree is under stress. Stress can be anything from disease to insect stress or even drought. 
So if it's a maple tree that's on your property that is starting to turn, my first solution for that is to go over there and do a deep and frequent watering. What I mean by deep and frequent watering is you're going there and just soaking it. So almost putting the hose on a trickle, leaving the hose there for a few hours so that we're soaking that area around that maple tree so that we can put water down deep into the surface. And we're doing that once to twice per week. And that will make sure that that plant, that tree has enough water source. So it's going to actually not go through as much stress. Fertilizer could be helpful as well at that moment, but it's usually stress that's causing those trees to change in terms of colorization. Um, as everyone, I hope everyone's having a good day. Helen Brown, I hope you are too. Uh, here we go. And this is what I love with the community as well, guys. Uh, replying to Christine Way, it has thin roots and difficult to get rid of. Tips? Oh, this is, a, I don't know what Christine's full question was there. So Christine, I didn't see, replying to Christine Way, it has thin roots and difficult and difficult rid of tips. Hmm. So Christine, Christine's a good friend, by the way, her mom, her mom worked with me uh, up at the berry store and her mom was an avid gardener. I'm telling you, her mom was one of the best people that I've ever met. Uh, Christine, in terms of getting rid of something with thin roots, the thin root system itself, always hand removal is going to be the key, right? Think about when we're removing an invasive weed species, what we're trying to do is we're trying to weaken that plant overall. We'll get to join in a second. Um, we're trying to weaken that plant overall. How can we weaken that plant, weaken that root so that we can cause its demise? What we can do is by removing its foliage, by constant hand removal or even putting mulch over top. So we do hand removal, mulching over top if it's in a garden. That'll suffocate that plant from seeing any sunlight, oxygen, uh, and also limiting its amount to get nutrients through photosynthesis back into the plant. So by constant removal over time, you will win the battle. Uh, if it's throughout your perennial plants, sometimes it's about removing those perennial plants, trying to remove as many weeds as possible, replanting the perennial garden, mulching in between, and then trying to make the perennials be the bully in there and thicken up that space overall. This is for Joanna. My sister-in-law has a Rose of Sharon in a sheltered spot. It appears to be dead. Any ideas? I told her to cut it right back apply some compost and hope for the best. So if we go up to that Rosa Sharon, or if we have a plant in our garden right now in this moment, and that plant uh, is not showing any leaves or signs of growth, next thing that we do is we go to the stems. If we go to bend the stem, that stem just breaks off in our hand, most likely dead. If we go to the bottom main stem, the, the trunk that's coming out, some people will call a trunk and or stem that's coming out of that flower shrub, we take our fingernail and we just scrape the bark down a little bit. If that bark appears to be uh, kind of white or we see some moisture that's there, even a little bit of green, there's still life in that plant. If that bark is very dry brown uh, and you'll even see how it just looks like it has no life, then it's dead and you'll have to remove it overall. Frankie, um, hybrid garden chrysanthemum doesn't grow back. So does coneflower. I have red coneflower. It didn't grow back this year. I want some red perennials for my garden. Please, please give me some red perennial plants. So this is from Miriam. Uh, good morning, Miriam, by the way, as well. So chrysanthemums sometimes will not come back. They have a shallow root system. Home flowers in a full sun location should grow back. There's actually poker plant, which is a red flower that you can use. Other red flowers that we can use as well is diplodina. There is a, a diplo, a hibiscus diplo, which is a large blooming hibiscus uh, that can grow back in full sun. Full sun is key for you to have that. Bee balm is a red flower as well. Bee balm can get fairly invasive, sometimes get powdery mildew as well, but does come in red. Uh, there are some of the stone crops that almost would be a purplish red. Uh, some of the sedums as well will be a purplish red. So there are some options out there. You need to know whether it's in sun and or shade. Here's another question we have from Barb this morning. Uh, my mom has a flowering crab tree and she has, she have, she's having a problem with leaves turning yellow, some with black spots and then falling off. What causes this? So this is a disease called black spot that fall off of those leaves. So what we want to do, keep that, um, forgive me, uh, keep that, uh, that flowering crab apple watered during the summer. Make sure it doesn't go through any additional str uh, stress whatsoever. We could apply lime sulfur now, but I, it's not going to do much. So in the fall, I would really recommend you cleaning up all those leaves. So any of the leaves that fall, we want to clean them up and we go on to get them off the property, remove them off the property. Next spring, you're going to apply a dormant spray kit combination horticultural oil and lime sulfur and you're going to do that before the buds crack on that crab apple that's going to make sure that any disease any overwintering disease and insects will actually be minimized and or 
diminish. And that's the best way to control black spot on a flowering crab. If you want to right now, you need to apply a fungicide. If you want to treat it this time, depends on the size of that crab apple, but it's easier uh, to treat with a dormant spray kit next spring and actually have a better year next year. Um, oh, here's another recommendation. A red perennial, easy to grow, mine sprout everywhere. Coral bells, Betty West, that's for shade, right? That's why we need to know. So if you're asking me questions, what is the best perennial? What I need to know is I need a perennial with a red flower for sun. I need a perennial that has, uh, a, that's a great ground cover for shade. So I always, what's really important for me is knowing what type of light that you have. And then the next thing is type of soil, frequency of water, and all those different things as well. This is Matthew Amos. Tell me good morning, and I hope you had a good time on your trip. We did. We had an excellent time, Matthew Amos. Uh, fantastic, by the way. Uh, Matthew's a good friend of mine as well. Uh, this is, uh, we have another, uh, where we go? This is Marlene from Mississauga. Um, my Rosa Sharon is loaded with buds. Haven't opened up yet, so just be patient. Mm. What I would recommend for you is I want you to get a white piece of paper. So you can see like a white piece of paper like this. Take one of those buds and you're going to take it outside on a table. You're going to put the white piece of paper down. And on top of that, you're going to pull apart the flower with the bud. Okay, you're going to pull that flower apart. Boom, 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 boom. And then if you see uh, like these little, little tiny, almost like they look like microscopic insects run across that white piece of paper, you have thrips. That's the one thing that can be impeding the uh, hibiscus from blooming. If you have thrips, then just do an application of insecticidal soap. It'll kill the adult thrips, uh, but you won't have as many blooms this year. Uh, a reminder as well, sometimes it's just holding off in terms of its bloom because it's just waiting for it not to be as stressed. So if it hasn't been watered, water is key, guys. Um, here we go. Uh, Lene, my good friend from Lene, Lene in good old Sault Ste. Marie. How do you stop suckers from growing off standard lilacs or snowball, uh, which is the viburnum? Uh, those guys there, you can't. You just have to remove them. There's nothing that you can do to stop them. So because it is a, a standard, that standard is grafted on top of another stem, right? So there's actually two little plants that are there. So that bottom stem is saying, I want to win. I want to win. It's putting bottom suckers out because what it's trying to do is take the energy down to the main stem bottom root system so that it could kill the top so that it could survive. Remember, it's like Darwin. Plants are like anything in life always battling for survival of the fittest. So that constant removal of those suckers on the base. And if you ever see anything growing at the base of a tree, remove it because that'll put more energy to the top and the root. So constant removal. There's nothing that you can do to stop it, Linnae. The only thing you can do is just get out there and do it. Get your husband Frank to do it. Get Frankie out there to do it. Tell Frankie that Frankie, tell him, but Frankie's busy at the restaurant. I know up there in Sault Ste. Marie, by the way. Uh, Paula Polly, my good friend Paula. Uh, I'll never plant trumpet vine again. It grows everywhere. Yeah, trumpet vine, you know, sometimes what happens is, especially with vines, we see them at like a really nice botanical garden. Uh, and at that botanical garden, I'll get to Marlene in just a second. At the botanical garden, they're very well taken care of. You can see that they almost look like they're just staying in their little, their little dedicated area. But a trumpet vine is like a teenage boy. You tell them to stay somewhere, but they're not going to stay there. They're going to go all over the place. They're going to go all on their own. They're going to create a mess all over the place. And trumpet vines do grow everywhere. They're very invasive. Uh, if you have a sunny spot where it's almost like a contained garden, uh, it can be beautiful, planted in the right place. But many vines can be invasive. Boston Ivy, Virginia Creeper. The reason why they call it Virginia Creeper is because it can be quite invasive. Uh, so just a reminder that five-leaf Akebia, which is also known as the chocolate vine. You want a strong, resilient vine? Yeah, but that freaking thing is going to grow everywhere. Like everywhere. Marlene, uh, my hydrangea plant only produced one flower. So with that, is that hydrangea uh, um, one that is a macrophilia, a large leaf, uh, which is pinks or blues generally? If it is one of those, then improper pruning could have removed the other flowers, and that's the reason why you only have one. If it is uh, like uh, Annabella, Incredible, uh, Piculata, or the Limelights, all those that bloom on new wood, if it only has one bloom, often that could just be that it's been restricted to light. Is there any insects that are on it? Marlene, please take a picture of it, frankie at frankieflowers.com, frankie at frankieflowers.com, and we will go from there. Um, <clears throat> Leslie, we have been finding a, an overabundance of lovely earwigs this year. Help, 
They were eating my lettuce and many flowering like petunias and other flowers in my perennials. Is diatomaceous earth safe for my veggies? Yes, indeed. So diatomaceous earth is one step that you can do by putting that down. Remember, a reminder that uh, earwigs are nocturnal and they come out at night and they're crawling. So you can do even crushed egg, like crushed shells. Like if you like mussels or you like seafood or, or something like that, and all those shells, the clams and all that, crush them up, put them around the base of the plant. The other thing that you can do is you can take a newspaper, some newspaper that you're not using. You're going to roll it up into a tube, put an elastic band around it. And then what you're going to do is just moisten that roll. So you're just going to kind of dampen that roll, put like get a little spray bottle and just spray it with a little bit of moisture. Then you're going to plump that in the garden where you have earwigs. When the sun comes up, the earwig is going to go, whoa, the sun's coming up. I need somewhere that I need to hide that's going to be dark. And I love it when there's a little bit of moisture there for me. So what happens is the earwigs are all going to go into those tubes. And then as soon as the sun's up, you go over to those tubes and you just put them into a garbage bag. Tie that bag off and you're going to remove a lot of that earwig population. The other thing that we need to do is also to figure out why are the earwigs there? What other area is causing earwigs to be there? Earwigs will be in areas where we have decaying wood. So let's say that you have a fireplace and you have a, a wood pile on the side of your house. That's habitat for those earwigs. So you will always have an earwig problem. Let's say that you have a deck that's starting and beginning to rot or some fence areas that are beginning to rot. That's habitat for earwigs. So often the time is when we get rid of the habitat, we'll actually reduce the earwig population. So first step is to figure out where earwigs are coming. Use the, uh, the rolled tube solution and presto, you're off to the races. Um, there are different earwig controls that are out there as well. The name earwig actually comes from uh, kind of folklore, thinking that ears, the earwigs will climb, they'll climb into your ears. Those bugs will climb into your ears when you're sleeping. Not true. Um, not true. Don't worry. Uh, how do you determine sun ratings? I bought flowers for soul sun, but they seem to get burned. I have a well-drained spot that is against the house and it's sunny from morning until night and hot, 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 so facing any recommendations. So Ashley, this is probably, you probably bought sun impatience or a sun patience. Uh, those guys there, even though they do well in full, full sun, they do need a lot of water. So it's not that they don't need full sun. It's also the type of soil and the water that they need. For a full, hot, blazing sun like that, I would pick geraniums. I would pick hibiscus. If you want something that will not overwinter, if you want something that will overwinter as a perennial plant, I'd pick stone crop or sedum. No problem. They'll do fabulous. Like even some of the purple sedums or even the uh, autumn joy sedum, fall blooming, really quite nice. And then you could do a border planting of even some, even fibrous begonias in a full hot sun can do very well. Um, dragon wingus begonias do really well in full hot sun as well. So sometimes it's the type of plant that also needs to be a little bit more tougher, but there's nothing like geraniums. There's nothing like hibiscus in full, full hot sun. Uh, okay. This is another question we have here from Karen. Good morning, Frankie. Some of my impatience are long and not spreading. The blooms are smaller than usual. I've been fertilizing week and week, weekly. Any idea what's happening? So Karen, this sounds like it's downy mildew in the impatience. So impatience, there are a few varieties of impatience that are downy mildew resistance. But if you didn't get those varieties of impatience that are downy mildew resistant, and you just got the traditional impatient wall arena, then what happens is you're going to get this, where you see these small, uh, long, not spreading, little small blooms, it's downy mildew. So I would recommend for you to remove the impatience don't play impatience in those space, in those spaces for a few years at least, or those downy mildew resistant type varieties of impatience that are available for you. Uh, and then think about now, if you want to replace and put some color in there, do begonias. You could do like Rieger begonias, tuberous begonias, all those coleus. If you want some foliage color, those guys there, but it sounds like you got downy mildew in those ones there. Uh, here we go. Christine Wade, I have a line of, 18 inch beech trees uh, turn into a hedge. What's the best way to trim and continue the growth? So the beech trees, what I would do is just allow them just to, to, to be right now, let them be their beach. The best time for pruning of that beach is in dormancy. So though that best time, because you can actually see the structure and also the plant itself. Dormancy is when we're getting into uh, anytime in late December, early January, uh, you can do the top pruning. If you wish, you can do side pruning on those guys as well. But if they're just been planted, then I would just let them focus on the root system and do no pruning for at least three seasons. 
just the last three seasons, unless you're seeing any sucker growth from the bottom or you're seeing any sporadic branches grow from the side. Any sporadic branches that are growing uh, at any time where they're just, you can prune those guys, but any structural pruning where you want to do some top pruning, want to do some side pruning, that's going to be best when they're in dormancy. Um, here we go. Frankie, please help me control potato bugs. Uh, this is from Nathleen. So once again, you can get uh, Beetle Be Gone. Beetle Be Gone will help you with potato bugs. No problem whatsoever with there. Pick and Squish will help you with potato bugs. A floating row cover over the top will help you with potato bugs. Those are all some solutions that'll help you. A reminder that if you have potato bugs, sometimes they'll go over to your tomatoes because potatoes and tomatoes are from the same family. But as I mentioned again, Beetle Be Gone, brand new product this year. Uh, that guy there is great for potato bugs and safe to use. Um, Michelle, can you tell me what fertilizer is the best for clematis? Mine are not blooming. So the reason why clematis, clematis or clematis will not bloom, you do need them in full sun, but you also need to keep the roots cool. So it may not be fertilizer. If you have lots of growth, it may be that you just need to shade the bottom root system. By shading the roots is really key. The other thing as well is if you're getting lots of foliage and no flowers, is they like an alkaline soil. So do a soil test to see where the acidity of your soil is. If it's running too acidic, that's what's putting foliage. And so what I would do first is make sure the roots are shaded, do a quick soil test. You can buy cheap ones on Amazon to tell you whether the soil is acidic and or neutral or alkaline. Then you can put some lime down. That lime will neutralize that acidity and make it more alkaline and help with the blooms. Uh, and then as well, depending upon what time of year your uh, cl clematis will bloom. If they're spring blooming and you prune them down in the spring, you maybe remove the blooms. But most Fridays are late summer blooming and bloom on new wood. Uh, here we go with another question. Arlene, what type of hydrangeas will grow in front west facing garden? Limelights, little limelights, fantastic. Incredibles, fantastic. As long as you're a good waterer, they're going to grow in that full sun kind of location. Uh, fire and ice. But I would tell you my absolutely favorite, favorite hydrangea for performance bloom and ease is limelight hydrangeas. If you want the big variety, you just get the regular limelights or little lime if you want dwarf variety. Arlene, they are amazing. Uh, here's another question that we have as well. Do you recommend Epsom salts for tomato plants? I do. You don't necessarily need them. The Epsom salts, what helps is they actually help that plant take in the nutrient. So they can very much help that plant be a more healthy and an efficient plant overall, but it's not necessary. Uh, I really like using the, the shaken feed, which is for tomatoes, the one with the red top, because there's calcium in the shaken feed. So it's a slow release fertilizer with calcium. And that calcium is really vital and important because that really minimizes the chance of getting blossom end rot. Blossom end rot is the bottom of the tomato where you get that scarring on the bottom of the tomato. Uh, this is from Marlene. Again, my snow on the mountain is absolutely beautiful. Great for shaded area, but very invasive. So there's a good example. Snow in the mountain is a very, uh, Invasive plant, if not planted in the right location. Snow on the mountain is what my mom actually has planted underneath some cedar trees where nothing will grow. And then she has a nice edge. That edge keeps them all very much contained. So planted in the right area, some of the invasive plants can be really good. But left unattended, they can then spread all over the place. So sometimes we always got to take nature and actually help it out as well. Good morning, Frankie. How do I remove periwig? Well, so invasive. There you go. There's another question, right? That periwinkle can be a fantastic round cover. And sometimes instead of removing it, maybe containing it by putting that really good defined edge around the garden and keeping that edge there so that things won't grow over is really key. Removing the periwinkle is hand removal. So hand removing, after you remove that area, even you tarp that area down, allowing no light to go through. And then that can create solarization, but it's going to be constant, constant hand removal because that perennial plant has a really strong root system. By removing it constantly and weakening that plant, mulching over top, what'll happen is over time, sometimes it can take up to three to five years before you totally weaken that plant overall. But removing invasive plants, that's a good idea for a blog post. I gotta write that down. You guys give me good ideas, by the way. You give me great ideas. Invasive plants blog. Thank you. Thank you for that, by the way. Uh, sorry, I didn't have a better answer for you. Uh, Marianne, good morning from Bolton. Good morning to you, by the way, as well. Uh, here we go. When do you cut suckers? Do you cut them right to the tree trunk? Yes, you do, Carol. 
You can actually just go over. A lot of the times it'll just pull off. But if you're using a paraprene, right to the trunk, right to the trunk, not into the trunk, just right almost flush with the trunk or just a little bit beyond flush with the trunk. But flush with the trunk is key. We're at 30 minutes, so we're going to take one more question here. How do you get rid of jade weed? Jade weed, also known as Jerusalem artichoke, is also that one with hand removal. You can use a non-selective herbicide like a Roundup, a reminder that Roundup will kill anything it's, uh, that it contacts. But sometimes you'll even see other growth that will come out. So a couple applications of Roundup, hand removal, uh, putting something in that space so that it can actually take the space over, or mulching restricting light. We're going to write a one on that too. Uh, one more thing. I'm going to see if there's anything out. Uh, just really, Susan, thanks from Windsor. Boom. Hi, Frank from Windsor. Um, we're just going to do a quick little one. Sorry, that was a mistake. I'm finding my volume. That's Sharon. <laughs> uh, and then there's another thing too with Matthew. Thanks for showing your pics as well. And then finally, we'll end off with Denise this morning. Good morning from Bob Cajun. Help, I have tons of anthills on my lawn. So with the anthills on your lawn, you can actually just go over and take your water, boil some water and pour it right over the ants themselves. You can put some ant baits down. Ortho has a bunch of ant baits that will be able to take care of that as well for you. Borax and sugar together can take care of it. Uh, even just taking your hose over to some of the bigger mounds and putting some water on them will drown them out. But the real recommendation is using some of the ant baits. The way the ant baits work is they actually take that bait into the mound, feed it to the queen, and by feeding the queen of those colonies, it actually will kill those little ant hills in your lawn because each one of those ant hills is a colony. So there you go, guys. Uh, it was a pleasure to join you today on this Sunday morning. I hope the sun shines on you today and the sun doesn't dry out your plants. I hope that you have lots and lots of fun in your garden this week. Make sure you put on some sunscreen. You'll see me live tomorrow morning on breakfast television right there live in, at six o'clock in the morning. Um, I really adore you all. Health and happiness. Um, just be kind and, and be good to everybody. Be good to everybody this week. Uh, I just want you to make sure that you give everybody a great hug and a reminder that gardening is always better than therapy. But if you don't feel good, make sure you go get some therapy, but also get some time in the garden, connect with nature. And at the end of it all, you get some tomatoes and there's nothing like fresh tomatoes in summer. Love you guys all. Uh, make sure you guys have a great week until next time. Boom. Frankie.